Okay, so we are going to start looking at section 5.2 now. Um, the section is going to be the definite integral And we're going to get a more generalized uh, way of approximating areas under curves. So in the previous section, we saw a lot of like the, you had a curve, you had a left endpoint approximation and a right endpoint approximation, and there was like a midpoint approximation. In this section, we're going to start looking at a, an approximation called a Riemann sum. And so the first thing that's different is instead of a left endpoint or a right endpoint approximation where all the bars were the same width, in a Riemann sum, your bars can be any sort of size that you want. So like, let's say I wanted to break this up into four parts. I could do my first bar out to here. My second bar could be like, say, here to here. And then my last couple bars could do something like that. Now, to set the height of a triangle, or set the tri height of these bars, we don't have to use the left, the right, or the middle point anymore. We're able to use any point in between uh, the starting and the stopping of the first bar, including the ends. So like, uh, if I wanted to say choose a C1 here, and let this represent the height of that first bar. So it hits the function there. And our first bar for the Riemann sum would look something like that. And then I could have chosen C1 over here, though, if I wanted to. Um, so C2 can be anything in between here. I'm going to choose it kind of closer to this edge here. Let's say here's C2, so it can be out to there. So we'll use that height for C2. I'll use over here for C3. And so we get something like that. And then C4 I'll put closer to the start than the stop of the bar C4. So it goes up till we get here. So for this particular Riemann sum, My bars are not uniform width. The heights are set just by any point in between the bars. It doesn't have to be an end point or a middle point. It just has to be a point for the first bar. It has to be any, any x value within the first bar. It can be used for the height of the first bar, etc. So this is going to be a more general way of doing approximations because bars no longer need to be the same width and the height no longer has to have a consistent method of choosing the height for the interval like always choose the left end point for a left end point thing. Now it can just be any point in between. So we're going to get a couple of vocab words for Riemann sums. So we're going to say a partition a P of size n So this is going to be a choice of points uh, that divide uh, the interval A to B into N subintervals. So like we would let uh, partition P, we could say, P is going to start at A, the beginning, that'll be our X0. And then uh, X1 can be next, X2 will be after that, so forth, so on. They, there, there can be any spacing in between these points you want. Uh, only restriction is X1 needs to be to the right of X0, but to the left of X1, and X2 needs to be between X1 and X3 but you can kind of space them however you want. Uh, sample points, which we call C. This is going to be a set uh, 
C equals C1, C2, on up to Cn. So this is going to be a collection of points where where each ci belongs to the ith interval where ci is an element so ci is an element of uh i guess we would say the interval x uh i minus one up to xi so what we're saying is c1 has to be between x0 and x1 C2 needs to be between x, x1 and x2. C3 would be between x2 and x3, et cetera. So each of these, uh, each of these CIs uh, needs to be in the ith interval. Um, we define the norm of P. Uh, we denote as double struck P. This is the maximum length of the uh, delta xi's. So this is going to be which 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 of these intervals is the longest? So uh, you know, would it be a up to this point here, this point here to that point. So which one's the longest? And that will be the norm of P for the collection. So we got that all set up. Now we're going to define what the Riemann sum R of F P C. This is going to equal the sum of I equals one up to N of F of C I, which will tell you the height of an interval times delta xi, which will tell you the width of the interval, and the height, uh, height times the width of the interval will tell you the length. If we wanted to, this is going to equal, if we want to write a kind of more expanded form of it, this would equal f of c1 times the length delta x1 plus f of c2 times the length, let me scoot this over because I'm going to run out of room. times the length uh, delta x2, plus so forth and so on. Eventually you get to the nth case, f of cn delta xn. So this is our equation. So we're going to use this to do an example real quick, and then... Uh, We'll probably stop on this part here and pick the rest of it up in the second video or third video. So they want us to find the Riemann sum of the given function with the given partition and the given collection of sample points. Uh, they give us f of x is equal to 8 plus 12 sine of x minus 4x on the interval 0 to 4. They give us our partition. x0 is 0, which is less than x1, which equals 1, which is less than x2, which equals 1.8, which is less than x3, which equals 2.9, which is less than x4, which equals 4. And then for our collection, this is going to equal this is a collection of sample points. This will be 0.4 for the first one, 1 1.2 for the next, 2 for the one after that, and then 3.5. So this is our sample points. These will set the heights of the interval. Okay. <clears throat> So this is going to equal the height of the first uh, the first interval, which would be the first interval's point is 0.4. So the function value evaluated at 0.4 would tell us the height of the first interval. To get the length of the first interval, we look at x1's value, which is 1, 
and we subtract it from x zero's value, which is zero, this will be the height times the length of the first interval. Then we add to that um, the height of the second interval. The length of the second interval will be x2, is, uh, its stopping value, or the, the further uh, x value for x2, and we'll subtract from it the x value from x1. That'll be the length from, uh, from 1 up to 1.8. Then we're going to add to that f of uh, x, the uh, third sample point is f of 2. Its interval will be 2.9 minus 1.8. And then the final one we'll have is f of 3.5. And its uh, interval will be 4 back to 2.9. So I'm going to use the uh, calculator to help me out with this. Um, on the AP test, so like you're never going to round an intermediate step of a problem on the AP test. So like what I'm going to do here, um, let me put in my function, which is going to be 8 plus 12 sine of x minus 4x. I'm going to look and see what is the value at 0.4 and I get that's 11.073. On the AP test, if you're doing this, uh, this sort of stuff on the AP test, you need to keep, you need to keep all the numbers. So like on the AP test, you would need to keep the whole thing. You can't round a uh, count round at intermediate steps on the AP test. But in interest of making our notes and make, getting me through the problem quicker, I'm going to round to three decimal points here. But just know on the AP test, don't round until the very end. So all, all your, your intermediate calculations need uh, all the decimals kept. So you don't, don't round till you get to the very, very last step. So what I'm doing here, if I did this on an AP test, I would probably be getting this problem wrong because I run into three decimal places here instead of keeping that whole string I wrote out. So next up is 1.2, which again, I'm going to round to three decimal places, 384. 1.8 minus 1 is 0.8. On the AP test, though, keep the whole thing. Keep every single decimal place. Next up is 2, which will give me a 10.912 times 2.9 minus 1.8 is a 1.1. And finally, we got a negative 10.209. And the interval length 4 minus 2.9 is 1.1. So one final time, I rounded at intermediate steps here. I rounded these each to three decimal places. For the calculus test, if you take the AP test, keep the full decimals and only, only round it once you get the final, final answer. All right, so I'm going to put these in to finish up. Um, Okay, so we get, this is about equal to 23.3535. So that is what that Riemann sum with that partition using that collection of sample points, that is what it ends up totaling up to. Let's see. I think we'll go a little bit further. We'll write out a definite integral and then uh, write out some stuff about signed area and do an example of signed area and then kind of pause there. 
So we say for definition, we say the definite integral of f of x uh, over a to b uh, denoted by the integral sign is the limit of the Riemann sums integral from a up to b of f of x dx that equals the limit as the norm of p goes to zero again the norm of p that was the uh, that was the longest length of the uh, of the partition so you figure out which which of those delta x's was the longest length and that length will be the uh, norm of the p so basically what we're saying when the norm of p goes to zero, we're saying the size of each of the blocks that you're using to uh, approximate area, the, the width of all those blocks goes to zero. This equals the limit as the norm of p goes to zero of the integral of i equals one up to n f of ci times delta xi. So this is a method of defining, or I guess this is our definition for definite integral. Um, we'll say when the above limit exists, so when the limit of these Riemann sums here exists and converge, uh, we say that uh, f of x is integrable over a to b. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna get a theorem, we're gonna draw some pictures, then we'll do an example, and then we'll probably pause for a bit there. So theorem says, If f of x is continuous on a to b, or if uh, f of x is continuous with uh, finitely with at most finitely many jump discontinuities then f of x is integrable over a to b Okay, so we're going to define something called the signed area. So the signed area of a region, this equals the area above x-axis minus the area below the x-axis. So if we had a chart that looked like this or a graph that looked like this sort of thing, say it started here and was doing something like that. And we were gonna look from say, A is the starting point here and B is our stopping point out here. 
This all would be positive area. This would be negative area. This all would be positive area. That would be negative area. That would be positive area again. So what we do is we find the area of these individual sections. We would add this. We'd subtract that from it. We'd add this to it, subtract that from it, and add the final bit. Well, we'll do an example to make this a little bit clearer in just a minute. So we get the integral from a to b of f of x dx. This is equal to the signed region between the graph and the x-axis over a to b. So this is the signed area, re uh, signed area of the region between the graph and the x-axis. over the interval a up to b. So we'll do one, uh, one example here to make this hopefully clear, and then we can uh, pause there for a bit. So this will be example two. They want us to find uh, or calculate the integral of zero to five of 3 minus x dx and the integral of 0 to 5 of absolute value of 3 minus x dx. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to find so we need to find the signed area in order to, to do this. Later we'll learn some better ways of taking, uh, evaluating the definite integral, like in section 5.3. Uh, five, we'll get a nice powerful formula, but uh, so far all we know is the definite integral is the signed area of the region between the graph and the x-axis over the region. So we're just going to have to deal with it that way. Um, if I graph that first, first picture there, um, let's see here. This is negative x plus 3, so that is the line negative, uh, negative x plus 3. That's a line with slope y-intercept 3, or sorry, slope y-intercept, not slope. It's a graph with y-intercept 3 and a slope of negative 1. So using that information, I'm able to graph it out to here. So we just get this straight diagonal line, pretend it's a little better looking than it is, but uh, we get a line like that. So this is 0 up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so basically what we have is we have a triangle here. That triangle will be positive signed area. And then down here, uh, we got a second triangle down here. And this triangle is below the x-axis. So this will be negative signed area. So I'm going to use that the area of a triangle is equal to 1 half base times height. So the base of this one here, this first one here, is 1, 2, 3. It has a base of 3 and a height of 3. So the area of that first triangle is 1 half 3 times 3. The second triangle has a base of 2 and a height of 2. But it's below, uh, it's below the x-axis, so it'll be negative 1 half 2 times 2. So the top triangle is 9 halves, which is 4.5. The signed area of the bottom one is going to be negative 4 halves, which is negative 2. So for our first, uh, first bit here, this is going to equal 
4.5 minus 2, which will equal 2.5. So we took the signed area of this piece, which was positive. We added the negative signed area to it, and that got us 2.5 there. So for the second one, it's wanting uh, 0 to 5, absolute value of 3 minus x. So we go and say, okay. One, two, three. So we get here, the graph of that one is going to look like this. And then it uh, goes back up. So we get kind of two triangle shapes for that one. So this one here. This one here is positive, and this time the rest of the triangle shape is above the x-axis rather than below the x-axis. So this uh, second little triangle that we got here, that one is also positive, uh, positive area. This one is length 3, width 3. This one is also length uh, 2, height 2. So we get basically one half uh, 3 times 3, which is 9 halves, which is 4.5 for the first triangle. Second triangle is 1 half, 2 times 2, which is 2, but it's positive this time because it's above the x-axis. It's not below it like it was. So we get 4.5 plus 2 this time because they're both above the x-axis. And this one will be 6.5. So that is how we find a uh, signed area, um, how we calculate the definite integral using the signed area. It's, if it's above the x-axis, it's positive area. If it's below, it's negative. And then you just total up, uh, you just total up the whole region. So we'll stop on uh, part one there.